So let's start the next session. I have a great pleasure to announce the speaker. It's Professor Adolfo Del Campo from University of Luxembourg, from Luxembourg, obviously. And the title of the talk is Universality of Phase Transition Dynamics Beyond the Kibble Zurich Mechanism. So please, Professor, you can start your presentation. Wonderful. So thank you, Alexander, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, thank you as well for the invitation to the organizers. It's a pleasure to be here on the occasion of the uh, Victor Dodonov's uh, birthday. So uh, let me. So I'm going to be talking about phase transitions and how some excitations appear in this context, uh, so-called uh, topological defects. Uh, let me just uh, put a picture of the city. This is where we are, uh, Luxembourg City. Uh, this has been uh, my group over the last uh, year. Uh, we work closely with the uh, group of Aurelia Chenou, also in Luxembourg, and also a speaker in this conference. And uh, yeah, over the last couple of months, my, my uh, group shrunk a bit. So now we are only a few left, uh, I think four, and hope, hopefully we grow back very, very soon. Um, for those who don't know me, you know, I guess to give a bit of an overview of the activities that we do. I also work on quantum manipulation, quantum computing, uh, information geometry, and quantum metrology quantum chaos and integrability and quantum control in particular uh, in the context of shortcuts to uh, adiabaticity. But today I want to focus on, uh, on, on these dynamics of phase transitions. And uh, first of all, I want to thank, uh, you know, and, and congratulate uh, Victor on his birthday. Uh, so I was looking uh, back and uh, it turns out that we met in 2007. There was a conference in Blaboyen. I managed to find the picture. So here is Victor and here I am between uh, the Manco family. Uh, so this was already an event on, on time-dependent phenomena and quantum mechanics, very much in the line of the current uh, workshop. Uh, I should thank uh, Victor, uh, yeah, as well for for the huge influence that his work has had on the context of uh, in my career, in the context of uh, uh, adiabatic invariants, and uh, much of the work uh, inspired uh, developments in the context of shortcuts to adiabaticity. Yeah. Cool. So let me, let me, yeah. So uh, when I think of Victor, you know, I remember distinctively him uh, kind of shaking a box to create phot photons. So uh, we are going to be talking about creating excitations and rather than shaking a box, uh, a cavity, we are going to be uh, driving a phase transitions. So the kind of excitations that we will create are a bit different. Uh, and for that, I want to introduce, uh, you know, some, some early ideas of how uh, cosmic strings uh, could have appeared in a cosmological context. And uh, then uh, how similar principles could be tested in the laboratory. Uh, so this is the, the overall topic of the uh, talk, which is that of phase transitions and the formation of topological effects. And I will present uh, some developments in the theory and some experimental tests in the context of quantum annealing, as well as some very recent results regarding uh, spatial statistics of uh, spontaneously formed topological effects. So let me let me get started and. Uh, First of all, I want to introduce a couple of characters that are key in this story. And one is uh, Sir uh, Tom uh, Kibel, who uh, was a long time uh, professor at Imperial College, London. You see pictures of him here at different stages of his career. And you may know him for many things. Uh, one is uh, the, uh, his contributions to the de development of the Anderson Higgs Kibel mechanism, uh, his textbook in classical mechanics. and perhaps his works on uh, symmetry breaking and phase transitions, in particular the prediction of the formation of cosmic strings uh, via the so-called kibel uh, mechanism that bears his name. Uh, his key uh, seminal work in this context in the, uh, was, was this one, uh, J. Fisse uh, in 76, where he uh, posted the idea that uh, during the uh, early stages of the universe, uh, phase transitions uh, occur that could have led to the formation of uh, topological defects and that this will crystallize as uh, cosmic strings. So this, this was a beautiful idea, it's, uh, motivated already by some uh, thoughts by Mermin in the context of condensed matter and uh, essentially it gave, gave rise to a community uh, devoted to the study of uh, cosmic strings uh, from a theoretical point of view as well as from an experimental point of view, but however today there are still no evidence, no experimental evidence uh, that I know of uh, regarding the observation of cosmic streams. His ideas, however, have had a huge impact in condensed matter, as it was realized 
that superfluid uh, helium uh, supports topological defects, defects such as vortices, similarly liquid crystals, superconductors, and uh, other superfluids can uh, uh, sustain topological defects. And it's very interesting that uh, ideas that were introduced in cosmology also apply to condensed matter in spite of the difference in the energy scales. And this is, of course, thanks to the fact that in the neighborhood of a phase transition, we have a similar uh, free energy landscape as we know from uh, Landau's theory. Well, right, so the second character in the story is Surek. Uh, you, I also put here different pictures of him. Uh, he's a well-known uh, theoretical physicist at Los Alamos National Lab, known for many things, uh, such as his uh, contributions to foundations of physics, in particular in the quantum to classical transition and uh, no cloning theorem, and as well his work on symmetry breaking. Yeah? So uh, I had the chance to, to meet uh, both uh, Kibel and uh, Surek when I was a student in my hometown, Bilbao. And later on, I had the chance to work uh, as a postdoc and as a faculty member on, on related ideas. Indeed, uh, you know, I, I happened to co-author the only work that they have together, Kibel and Surek. Uh, so there's a picture of, of a conference in Cosmic Streams with uh, Tom Kieber around here and myself being there. Good. So let me tell you a bit the theory. The key prediction of the theory is very simple. You take a, you know, think of a, a, a high symmetry phase say, of a bunch of spins at high temperature where the average magnetization is zero because it's spin points in a random direction. Now, if you were to cool the system or to do a quench in the system, uh, reducing the temperature in some time scale, tau q, you will see that due to the ferromagnetic interactions, there's preferential alignment of spins along given directions. But these domains have finite size. Uh, they tessellate the sample, but different, different domains have different uh, magnetization. So the, the locally, the local magnetization takes now a finite value. Now, when you drive this phase transition, uh, this is a typical continuous second order phase transition, you expect uh, the formation of these uh, domains of finite size and the topological defects lie at the interface between adjacent domains. Um, and the questions that arise is, for instance, what's the typical size of these domains or what's the density of topological defects? I see Uwe Fischer in the first row, so he's also an expert on this. Uh, so the, the prediction that Kibel and Surek came out with is that the average size, the average, average length scale of these domains uh, follows a universal power law with the time scale in which the phase transition is driven. So if you go very fast, this uh, tau, tau, tau q is very small and the uh, average length scale will be very small. So you will get lot, lots of little domains. Uh, if you go more slowly, you recover kind of a diabetic intuition that uh, there should be a single domain uh, covering the whole system size and the density of defects will be very small. But what is interesting is that this power law, this prediction for the average size of the domains is universal. So it's fixed by uh, uh, critical exponents of the system at equilibrium, even if we are away from equilibrium. So let me try to put a cartoon picture of how the kibel schreck mechanism can be derived in a somewhat hand-waving way. Uh, it uses the equilibrium uh, divergence of the relaxation time and the correlation length as function of uh, the distance of the control parameter, say the temperature or a magnetic field, to its critical value. And these power laws, uh, which are um, you know, typical of the system at equilibrium, are characterized by the critical exponents, Z and nu, that govern uh, the divergence of the relaxation time, critical slowing down, and of the correlation length. So what the kibel schreck mechanism considers is the possibility that the control parameter now varies in time. So say we change the magnetic field or we cool the system. And we do, you know, for any time dependence, we will be able to linearize it around the critical point in such a way that this reduced distance just varies linearly in time in some time scale tau q. Yeah. So with, with this variation, we can now consider what will be the instantaneous relaxation time, and it will be a power law of this form, something that diverges. So far from the critical point, it will be very small. Uh, once you cross the phase transition uh, deeply in the broken symmetry phase, you will have also a small uh, relaxation time. But in the neighborhood of the critical point, it, it will be uh, very, the system will be very slow, uh, very sluggish because of this divergence. Now, uh, the kibel schreck mechanism estimates the characteristic, the, the time elapsed after crossing the phase transition, that equals the instantaneous relaxation time. 
uh, so yeah, so the me you measure, you pass the critical point, uh, you uh, you set your clock, and whenever that time matches instantaneous relaxation time, you define this characteristic time scale, which is so-called freeze out time. And with this freeze out time, the theory uh, just makes instantaneous correlation length and this value, and that's what leads you to the famous power of prediction for the Kibel Surek mechanism. This was all classical and very hand waving in some sense. There were studies in, in, the, in the quantum case done with the spin systems, such as a uh, Ising e chain. And this is a nice solvable model where everything can be worked out in detail. And here you have a bunch of, you know, just a linear spin chain with some magnetic field. When G is large, uh, spins align along the x direction. When G is small, uh, ferromagnetic interactions kick in and the spins are either aligned in the up or down uh, direction. Now, if you decrease the magnetic field from a large value to uh, a small value, to zero, say, uh, when the ferromagnetic interactions dominate, and you do it non, uh, you know, in a non-adiabatic way, if you do it fast, then you are going to produce uh, excitations. And these excitations will be the topological effects. And you can, you know, these excitations will be kind of a spin down, spin up uh, configurations uh, that uh, you can count with a, a king number operator. Uh, takes this form is essentially related to the ferromagnetic interactions and a series of works in 2005 considered the variation of the magnetic field in a time scale tau q and estimated the expectation value of this observable and find out that indeed follows a uh, depend a power of dependence on the quench time which matches the prediction by kibel and surek if you use the uh, critical exponents for for the transverse field in chain which are new and set equal to one so this, you know, this was an um, exactly solvable test that the kibel surek mechanism does not only apply to classical systems, but it holds as well in the quantum case. Um, you know, this is 2005, so by now we have uh, lots of uh, theoretical and experimental evidence. Uh, the kibel surek mechanism has been tested in ion chains, multiferroics, uh, colloids, uh, BC, in 2D, in 1D, with soliton formation, with vortex formation. So, you know, lots of experiments support uh, this prediction. And it's nice to see that ideas that were developed in a cosmological setting were brought to condensed matter, then to quantum simulation, and then to, finally to quantum computing and uh, quantum annealing. So, in, the, in, in this, uh, the kibel schreck mechanism has been seminal. Now, you may wonder where there exists universality beyond the kibel schreck mechanism. And this is a question that we posed uh, a few years back where we say, well, I, I'm not interested in the mean number of excitations. I want to know what's the distribution of the number of excitations. Um, so how can we do it? Well, in a classical case, it will, it's very intuitive. It's very, I just introduced a hand waving model that will give you an idea of why to expect universality beyond the mean. And the idea is, you know, imagine that your system is also a chain. You can extend this to higher dimensional uh, systems. But imagine it's just a chain. And you break it down or you split it into pieces uh, that have the kibel surek uh, size, the, the size for the non-equilibrium correlation length predicted by the kibel surek mechanism. So these are, will be kind of not quite domains, but proto-domains. You know? So we expect coherence of the order parameter in this length scale. And this is our total system size. And the model we introduce is that at the uh, boundary between these partitions, of size dictated by the kibel surek mechanism, with a well-defined probability, we are going to create a kink, say, with probability p, or a topological defect with probability p. And with one minus p probability, we get no defects at all. So this is a, some, you know, this is very simple, and it states that the distribution of the number of defects should have a binomial form where the number of coins that you throw is essentially the system size divided by the kibel surek correlation length. Uh, so the distribution is binomial, and of course, in the uh, you know we can uh, find that asymptotically approaches a Gaussian, where the, the mean is peak at the kibel surek prediction, and the variance is linear, is proportional to the average. Yeah, so this is a peculiar uh, kind of uh, limit. So let's test whether this naive model is accurate, and uh, just to convince you. Uh, okay, so first of all, let me just do a bit more of analysis and. You know, given a distribution, so this is the distribution for the number of topological defects. I can take its Fourier transform, find the characteristic function. I take the logarithm, that's the cumulant generating function, which has this formal expansion in terms of cumulant kappa q. And now, from for the binomial distribution, you know that the the characteristic function is proportional to the average. 
And therefore, we expect, since the average scales universally, according to the Kibel schwerk mechanism with the quench time, we expect not just the average, but actually all cumulants of the distribution to follow the same power law, yeah? to follow the same uh, universal power law. So is this true? Is this not? Uh, let me test it in a simple model for phase transitions. Classical uh, time-dependent Ginzburg-Landau on a lattice, one-dimensional with a real scalar field which evolves according to some Langevin equation where I put a dissipation term and some uh, noise database fluctuation dissipation theorem. This model is similar to the uh, paramagnet to ferromagnetic interactions. So you, you can think of double wells which are linearly coupled. And as I change the uh, lambda, I can go from a single to a double well configuration so I can uh, break parity. So, so if I change lambda infinite time, I'm in the setting uh, to explore kibel uh, and also physics beyond the kibel mechanism. So we did this numerically, and here you, you see the result. What we expect from kibel is that the first cumulant, the density of defects, uh, follows a universal power law with the quench rate. This is verified. But what we expect from this uh, theory beyond the kibel mechanism, st studying the full counting statistics of defects, is that uh, the second cumulant and the third cumulant also follow this power law. Yeah? So we all, all, all see, always see this universal regime where all cumulants follow the same power law. And then, of course, at, far, at fast quenches, we know that uh, the system of, system of finite size saturates uh, to a plateau, and this happens for all cumulants. Yeah? Uh, so th these cumulants are, are extracted from the histograms, and this is the typical distribution that you see when you go very fast. Uh, you are far from the origin, so you get something that looks very much like a Gaussian, but as you approach the adi a adiabatic limit, uh, then the distribution start having a probability of having no defects at all, perfect adiabaticity, and here you see the distribution is asymmetric, so it's, it's not a Gaussian, it's uh, really a binomial distribution. Okay, so this uh, supports uh, you know, uh, the, that there's universality beyond the kibel surek mechanism in the classical case. Uh, what about the quantum case? So we can take the same model, uh, the transverse field easy model, and look to the same of, uh, at the same observable, the, uh, the number of kinks or the number of kink pairs. But instead of uh, you know looking at this ex expectation value, we can look at the eigenvalue statistics. So the probability that that observable, the number of kink pairs, has a well-defined uh, value, yeah, an integer. And again, I can, whenever I, I have such a uh, distribution, I can introduce its Fourier transform, the characteristic function. And in this case, it's very nice that the uh, characteristic function is just the exponential of a Hermitian operator. And the King number operator has a very simple representation that allows you to exactly compute it, the form of the uh, characteristic function. It's really the, the product of this, uh, sing, you know, this is the, the characteristic function of a classical of, of a classical coin with a bias. With probability pk, you get heads. With probability 1 minus pk, you get tails. So you like throwing different coins, which have different bias, each of them, where the success probability pk is predicted by the landau Senner formula. So this builds on a, a, a early solution uh, by 2005, which already told us that we should uh, estimate the success probability for kink formation uh, with the landau Senner formula. But now we can look at the uh, statistics and find that it has this form. So, you know, you go to our textbook on probability theory and you recognize that this is actually uh, a distribution which is well known, is the so-called Poisson binomial distribution. So, essentially, in the quantum case, we can prove that, you know, uh, we have a universal form of the uh, number distribution of topological defects. Because we have the exact result, we can plot it very easily for arbitrary system size. Uh, so this is what you get when you go very fast. You have a, uh, something that rem resembles a Gaussian, uh, peak at large values and very broad. And as you go more and more slowly across the phase transition from the paramagnet to the ferromagnet, the distribution shifts towards the origin, and then it gets, you know, it becomes narrower and also it becomes more asymmetric when once uh, you start to have uh, a finite probability to get. Uh, uh, um, uh, the absolute ground state with no excitations. Good. Um, you know, this is, there are histograms, so sometimes it's much nicer to characterize a distribution through cumulants. Uh, so here you'll see that it fits a Gaussian, where again, the mean and the variance uh, are set by the Kibbels prediction. Uh, but we can do better. We can look at the uh, cumulant generating function. So take the logarithm of the characteristic function 
and in this for this model is uh, simple enough that we can compute it and it takes this this form it's just a one dimensional integral uh, and it's actually very nice because if you take the uh, limit of very slow quenches this integral collapses into something which is even simpler which essentially tells us that the cumulant generating function is just proportional to the kibbles rec density of defects the old prediction times a function which only depends on the conjugate variable to the number of defects. So this is just going to give a, a numerical prefactor. But if I compare this equation with the exact solution, I realize that all cumulants are going to be proportional to the kibbles rec density in the quantum case, up to some numerical prefactor. Yeah? So for instance, to give you an idea, the density of course is matched by kibbles rec, but the variance as well is proportional to the density up to a numerical prefactor the same thing happened for the third cumulant, which equals the third center moment, up to a different numerical prefactor is proportional to the uh, kibbles rec density. What is nice is that the distribution is actually not normal. This is a non-Gaussian. It's, it's a Poisson binomial distribution. So what you know, we can test whether this, this power loss actually hold. In principle, theoretically, the exact solution suggests that there should be power loss. And indeed, when we do a study for a finite system size, we see beautiful power loss for the first cumulant as a function of the uh, quench time uh, for, for the density, for the fluctuations, for the variance of the number of kinks, and for the third center moment, and so on. And of course, for a finite system size, you see deviations uh, when you go very slowly due to the uh, onset of adiabaticity. And also, you, we see deviations when we go very fast because the landau Senner formula we are using breaks down. But uh, this is to be expected. Good. So with both in the classical and, the, and in the quantum case, we have uh, evidence of universality beyond the kibbles rec mechanism. Now, beyond the models I have discussed, which were the 1D 5-4 theory and the uh, 1D uh, transverse Felicity model, we also have evidence that it holds these ideas hold in higher dimensional systems with vortex formation and in uh, dissipative open systems, uh, as we tested in, in the wave. So let me tell you a bit uh, what we did in, in, in a quantum computer. We were really trying to see uh, to what extent these uh, D-Way devices, which are programmable quantum missing simulators, uh, are unitary or not, and whether they uh, comply with the dynamics that we expect. So this is a long collaboration with the group of Hidetoshi Nishimori, Daniel Lidar, and, and many other colleagues, including Fernando Javier Gomez Ruiz, who was a postdoc in, in my group. And what we did was, okay, we understand very well what's the transverse Felicity model and its dynamics. So let's embed this model that we understand in the machine. And we, we chose two different machines, one at NASA, one at Burnaby. And by the specifications of the machines, when we change the magnetic field here, A, we also need to change the amplitude of the uh, ferromagnetic interactions or anti-ferromagnetic interactions. And uh, then, well, we can... Uh, for, for technical reasons, uh, for those uh, familiar with D-Wave, it's convenient to embed the, the model you are interested in studying in different ways. So we do self-avoiding uh, self random walks and embed the easing chain in 200 different ways. And for each embedding, we run 100, uh, 1,000 ramps. Uh, so we, we do the kibbles uh, schedules 1,000 times to collect the statistics. So this is very nice because we have for, for each, um, we have 200,000 uh, sampling realizations uh, for the transverse Felicity model for its quench time. So this is a huge, huge statistics. Very hard to achieve in any other experimental platform, whether you are thinking of analog or digital quantum simulators. Now, so we collect the data and first we look at the density of defects and try to fit power loss. And what we observe is that for large system sizes, we could uh, fit a power law consistently, uh, ruling out uh, small system sizes that are known to be uh, to behave differently due to the, the, the machine specifications. So the, when we try to see whether the machine is following anything like the kibbles rec mechanism, we can fit a power law and extract a power law exponent. But this power law exponent uh, takes values of the order of 0.2 or 0.3. So in different machines, it takes different values. And at any rate, it's completely different from the theoretical prediction that should be one half. One half is what you should get in the transverse Felicity model, and we get other, other values, yes? 
So it appears that it's following Kibel Surek, but in a different way, with a different exponent. And so you, we can plot here the, the range of possible values of the Kibel Surek ex exponent for the power law of the density of defects as function of the quench time. For an isolated easing chain, we should have a value of one half. For a classical easing chain, also a close value. We see data from these machines close to 0.2 point, uh, and 0.34. And a model that was able to explain the, the data in this machine is a model of a dissipative uh, easing chain, of an easing chain coupled to a path. So uh, from that point of view, this will be the first test of the kibel schweck mechanism in a many-body open quantum system. Let me tell you a bit the model. So the model is just that of the easing chain in which its spin is coupled to a set of independent harmonic oscillators. And we assume uh, we model the spectral function with a sharp cutoff in the ohmic regime, where we can include a parameter eta uh, that are, will be tunable. Yeah? And for this model, uh, already there was theory by the group of Subir Sagrev and Felix von Oppen that uh, predicted that the phase transition survives in spite of the coupling to the bath but that the critical exponents get renormalized from, from 1 to 0.6, from uh, set equal 1 to 2, uh, roughly. So that's what allows us, you know, that's essentially what leads, gives rise to this value of 0.28. Already from, yes, in analytics kind of study. But now numerically, we can tune the, the properties of the bath and see that this, uh, just by even at zero temperature, by changing the value of eta, we can uh, see power loss for the density versus the kneeling time with power law exponents that vary from, from the, that value of the system in isolation to the values observed in the D-wave devices, such as 0.2 and 0.32. Yeah, so we can cover the phenomenology observed in D-wave devices with this, with this model. OK, so you know, from that point of view, as I said, this is the, the first test of Kibel's work in a many body open quantum system. But uh, we can also do. Uh, uh, study physics beyond the kibel surek mechanism. So since we have such amazing sampling statistics of 200,000 realizations, we can build histograms. And this is data from the machine. This is not numerics, even if it looks so pretty. So this is the kink number, uh, kink pair number distribution. And uh, for different annealing times, different quench times, and you see this, these fits, which uh, appear to comply, you know, to follow just yes, a Gaussian distribution. This is an approximation. But as we get uh, close to the uh, diabatic limit, you see the distribution becomes asymmetric. Yeah. Okay, so that's very nice. Uh, and I mentioned that the prediction was that all cumulants follow the same power law. So let's test that one. And now with D wave data, what we see is that all cumulants indeed follow the same power law within error bars as a function of the annealing time. So this is the density verifying the Kibel Schreck prediction, but now for an open system the fluctuations in the number of kinks, and the third central moment all following power laws. Yes. Now, because all follow the same power law, if we take ratios of cumulants, we divide, for instance, the variance by the mean, we should get a constant. We should get something that is independent of the annealing time. And again, that's what we see. Uh, error bars increase as the annealing time increases. But you know, uh, we have uh, a good, a good uh, you know, within uh, uh, numerical uh, 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 the, the, the error bars, we do have constant values of the cumulant ratios. And surprisingly, the value of the cumulant ratios is that of the system in isolation. So uh, coupling the chain to the bath uh, does not change the shape of the, distrib the, of the distribution. The only thing that it does is to change the dependence of the average as a function of the annealing time. But the shape of the distribution remains Poisson binomial uh, in spite of the fact that the system is open. So that's why the cumulant ratios are constant and independent of the quench time and equal to those of the system in isolation. So both for the isolated system and for the open system, we'll have the same uh, distribution. Right, so, okay, so this is, you know, so we have tested this universality of the shape of the distribution. It remains Poisson binomial. It's robust against the coherence, uh, only the dependence of the average changes with annealing time. And this is the first test of uh, physics beyond the kibel schreck mechanism in any many of the system, whether uh, closed or open. So that, that's where, where our study finished. And it was interesting to see that um, a few months later, after the publication of our manuscript, uh, the D-Wave team uh, repeated the study uh, with shorter annealing times. And of course, the faster you go, the less uh, relevant is the coupling to the environment. So by doing that, they could uh, make the, the coherence negligible 
and actually uh, they collected as well histograms for the uh, distribution of the number of kinks, and uh, they studied the dependence of the cumulant race, uh, of the cumulants on the annealing time, as we did. But now what they see beautiful power laws, and uh, what they see now is that the dependence on the annealing time is that of the isolated system. So simply by going faster, they could uh, remove the role of the coherence and uh, get agreement with the theory of the easing chain in isolation. Uh, good. So I, I just want to, uh, you know, so th th this has been the progress of studying the uh, uh, physics beyond the kibble sweat mechanism regarding the full counting and statistics of defects. Uh, but I want to mention that we also did, you know, just in a couple of slides with this uh, supplementary work, not focusing on the number of fluctuations, but focusing on the spatial correlations, on the spatial statistics. And the model we came out is for the distribution of topological defects across a after crossing a phase transition is a very simple model. Uh, we assume uh, that we have we look at uh, topological defects that are point-like, like kinks or vortices. And we assume that they are distributed by a homogeneous Poisson point process in which the density is dictated by the kibel schreck mechanism. So imagine you have a superconductor or a superfluid, a BC. You, you start with your thermal atomic cloud and you condense it. You drive Bose-Einstein condensation in finite time. So you are going to see vortices proliferating in the sample. And what we claim is that these vortices will be distributed as a Poisson point process with a density dictated by the kibel surek mechanism. To verify this model, we can compute properties such as the spacing distribution. So that's the distance given a vortex was the closest vortex, provided that all other vortices are farther away. And given that these are essentially a Poisson point process, then we can compute analytically in closed form what's this distribution for uh, the space in between vortices in this example. Uh, so we can do this in, in, in 1D, uh, one spatial dimension, two spatial dimensions, three spatial dimensions for point-like defects. And in 1D, we expect an exponential decay of the space in distribution. In two dimensions, like in this plot, we expect a bigner Dyson distribution. That's what this formula tells us. Uh, the value of R is fixed by the average spacing divided by the kibel surek correlation length. And in three dimensions, we have a similar prediction, where this is S2 uh, times X2 exponential minus S to the 3. Yeah? OK, so is this model good or not? Yeah? So we, we again test it with uh, some, some paradigmatic models. So, I choose the same model I, I mentioned before, the one-dimensional uh, phi 4 theory with a real scalar field. And you see here snapshots of the order parameter as a function of the system size when I go very fast, a bit more slowly and more slowly. Yeah. So this, this, this is a domain where the order parameter is in a single well or in a, in a, in a well of the double well, then it's a jump to the other double well. And these jumps are the kinks and anti-kinks. So the density of them, we already know that it follows the kibel surek mechanism. So it complies with the power law as function of the quench time. But what about the spacing distribution? So we have predicted an exponential decay uh, with this Poisson point process theory. And what we see is that this, this theory is good as long as the spacing is uh, larger than one. The normalized spacing, which I introduced before, which is uh, you know, the spacing divided by, by, the, by the average, uh, is, uh, should decay exponentially. But we see this is only true uh, for S larger than one. At short distances, uh, uh, maybe this is not a surprise, we can think of this uh, distribution of kinks a bit like a classical gas. So uh, kinks and anti-kinks can annihilate. This gives rise to uh, effective short-range repulsion. So that's why you see the probability of having two kinks, a uh, kink and an anti-kink, very near is, is zero, and only then the distribution peaks. Yeah? So people have studied this kind of distribution, and this is something called the Torquato distribution. Uh, so there's an engineer at Princeton who, who uh, consider random point processes of disks. And what you get is a distribution which uh, reproduces ac accurately the numerics for, uh, for this five four theory. Yeah? So we find evidence of universality, but of course defects interact. And this is what our theory based on a Poisson point process is lacking. Yeah? We did the same thing for vortex formation. We took a holographic model of a Stronica pole superconductor, but you know, a BC could have done as well. We look at the space, we check that kibel surek holds, and we look at the spacing distribution. And we expected the Birner Dyson, and we see that you know the data is in a good agreement with this Birner Dyson distribution, but you can see again short range uh, anti-banching, spatial anti-banching 
that our theory with no interactions between defects does not have also at long days. Yeah? So this, the, the actual distribution is a bit more concentrated around the mean. Good, but that, that kind of tells you that there is universality as well in the spatial statistics of topological defects up to uh, deviations that arise from uh, the interaction between topological uh, defects. All right, so with this, I, I, I just want to close. So, you know, I, I mentioned how we can create excitations, actually topological defects, by driving a phase transition. The canonical theory is the kibel schurek mechanism, but there is much more universality. There's universality beyond this kibel schurek mechanism that we have tested in isolated. Five enough. minutes left. <clears throat> and uh, we have also indicated that there's not just universality in the distribution of the number of of, of defects, but also in their spatial correlations. So that's all what I wanted to say. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the wonderful talk. We have questions. I think Uwe is the first one to raise his hand. Greetings to Luxembourg, Adolfo. Yeah. yeah, so um, as you know, the Ising chain and 1D is very special, and um, the number of excitations is same, the same to the number of topological defects. I mean, with Ralph Schutzel, as you know very well, we have pointed out that this can lead to a very different statistics of the defects in higher dimensions. You mentioned that you have evidence that universality of the statistics also holds for vortices that is in higher dimensions. Um, on which level is that evidence? Uh, numerical. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, you, have, you see the ingredients of our theory. So I, I agree that it can break down, but uh, for, for points like topological defects, the distribution of the number of defects. Now, the last part was about uh, spatial correlations, and that that's much much more sensitive. But the distribution of the number of defects is for point like topological defects. Um, this, I think as we have accumulated a strong evidence that uh, it is uh, binomial in the classical case, or pass on binomial in quasi free Fermi models, in free Fermi models like the transverse Felicity model, the X-ray model, Kita so, chain, and so on. Uh, for 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 other models, you know, like uh, I, we actually know of some cases where at least some uh, some colleagues have observed data where the, they can break down. But you know, I think you know, it's, uh, they have pretty broad generality. In two D or even three D, you might even have this very nice power loss for the cumulants. Is that true? I believe so. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, actually, I have shown you, I have shown you that that's the case. Yes, uh, maybe I went a bit too fast, but uh, um, um, actually, no, I haven't shown I haven't shown you this. You data. mentioned yes. very briefly. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we have, you know, for instance, this Yeah paper where we did it for for uh, we look at the vortex formation in a superconductor. We look at the uh, counting full counting statistics, and that uh, matches very accurately. Uh, the no, uh, 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 actually what is called a even Poissonian distribution, uh, and this is just because of the numerics is done with periodic boundary conditions, so uh, there's a bunch of uh, specific features to that. But uh, if you open the boundary conditions, we have also some that you recover the binomial distribution. Uh, you know, if you have uh, topological defects with which are not point like, like domain walls or you know, like skirmions, you know, more non local. Um, uh, you know, other textures, um, the, we, we don't know, we don't know. Uh, you don't yeah, know. This may, this may break, this, this yeah. possibly breaks down. Yeah. So yeah. I emphasize that it's only for point like defects. Okay. Any further question? If not, let's the, thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Adolfo. My pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.